Good morning, everybody. Um, my name's Maureen Sullivan, um, and I'm the Director of Library and Learning Services at Griffith University. Um, and I'm the mentor of the QLOC Information Resources Working Group. So I wanted to start with an acknowledgement of country. We acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which UQ operates. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connection to country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. It's my pleasure to welcome you here today at this event which is going to look at how we are, where we are now in terms of e-book accessibility and ask what more librarians and disability advocates can do to ensure reading equality for all. We have three fabulous speakers, uh, Dr. Paul Harper, who will discuss widespread e-book availability, Pam Schindler, who is going to talk about what makes e-books accessible and offers practical advice on how to implement inclusive purchasing in your organisation, and thirdly, Tom Joyce, who's going to provide an update on the changes to copyright and, implica and the implications of the Marrakesh Treaty for libraries. So we will start with our first speaker, who's Pam, Pam Schindler. And Pam is a former library liaison librarian with more than 30 years experience. Mr. Morgan, I think Paul was to go first. Paul's going first. Oh, sorry. sorry. The slide is wrong. OK. Regroup. My paper is right. The slide is wrong. OK, Paul is going to go first. Sorry, Paul. So, Dr Paul Harper is the Senior Lecturer with the TC Burney School of Law, University of Queensland, and the Fulbright Future Scholar and International Distinguished Fellow, Burton Blatt Institute, Syracuse University. That's a mouthful, Paul. Yeah. Uh, Paul Sorry. has written extensively on copyright and accessibility, most recently in a book entitled Discrimination, Copyright and Equality, opening the e-book for the print disabled. Please welcome Paul. You stand there, it'll come through well on the stickers. Awesome, thank you very much. Okay. Well, I'm sorry, I might just have to, they've asked me to close the door. Okay. That's all right. And I think I might have to move you. Well. Because it's going to hit cool. the back. There we go. All right, a bit of logistics. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's, that's now the first dance is over. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, so many of you here would be librarians. Why did you become librarians? Think about that for a moment. Was it for money? <laughs> I hear laughter. Well, if you wanted that, you might have, were in the law library, perhaps study law. Well, how many of you really did like, became librarians because you felt called to help people access books. Yeah, how many of you used to collect books as kids? Yeah. yeah, perhaps read books when you're meant to be asleep in bed and hide under the covers with a torch. Now they use, now they use e-books. Well, I gather you all, by that response, you all have love of books. Well, I see, I have a love of books as well. The only difference is many people like me haven't been able to access them for many years. People with print disabilities across the globe have had a love of books but had not been able to fulfill that love. We wanted to read, but in a society where there is a book, a books are plentiful, we could only access a few. Well, most people could walk into any library across in Queensland and Brisbane, we've got public libraries everywhere, we've got fantastic libraries. Anyone could pick up a book. If you have a print disability, whether it be mobility, unable to hold a book, unable to read a book with your eyes, whether it's dyslexic or you're dyslexic, unable to read. Now, this was, some people had stats around 7%. In some countries, it's closer to 0%. Now, has that been ongoing? Well, we've got a paradigm shift, new world, and it's fantastic. There's still a book famine, but, but in the higher education sector, in where we're sitting now, I believe there's an end in sight. There are, today, we're going to talk about step, what can be done and what steps you can take here. Now, I'm only privileged to talk to you for about 15 minutes. So in 100 years, this library is still going to be here. Um, it's been here for all my 75 years. So I want to think, see, what can we do now to, in 100 years, have this place a more inclusive space? 
So why, is, why are books more accessible? Well, the print book is still a closed book to me, to be honest. I could scan it, but now I've got e-books. E-books are amazing. Millions of books on your um, iPhone or e-book reader. My iPhone's in my bag because it's buzzes in my pocket. Um, books, e-books born digital. So they're born in a format where you can read. Now, if you have a screen reader, you have a, a my phone, you can turn voice over on, a Macintosh, universal design. You can read those books. There's audible books. Um, so the books have become a much more accessible. So today we're going to introduce this paradigm shift and see what you can do here. I'm going to talk a lot about the international norms um, and then some of the practice. Then Pam's going to talk about practices and Tom at the Marrakesh. And okay, so, so let's think what are some of the key barriers to access now? Well, first, digital, digital technology. So at some sort of information communication technology, whether it be if you leave what, a laptop, your phone, your Kindle, your Amazon um, reader, whatever, it is, whatever your device is, a device that can read the book, so an actual machine, then can you get to the book? So think about that as can you get physical access to a library, wheelchair accessibility? Well, for the e-library, e the e-space, it's the website. Is the website accessible? Now that's something libraries can control um, or publishers, it's quite, that's an easy one. And where it gets, gets hard is other books in an accessible format. And that becomes a lot more complicated because that's where you have accessibility barriers created by the way the book is designed um, and copyright issues, which we'll talk about, which we talked about later with Marrakesh. And then the final barrier is libraries. Do they purchase accessible books or do they favor ones that aren't accessible? So in a situation where you have a book, one publishing house produces books that can be read by everyone, and another one produces books that can only be read by, um, by a majority of the people, but a minority are excluded, which, one are purch which one's purchased? Okay, so I want to talk a bit more now about how e-book, how e-books have created this potential. Okay, so I have a screen reader, which you might be able to hear a bit through your headphones. Now, that turn, that, what that's doing is turning the what's on the screen into audible text. That's one adaptive technology. Other people have large, turn the screen into larger text. Um, other people simply having the device, having a digital is enough that they want to hold it in there. Um, they um, um, have a mobility impairment. Um, people with dyslexia want to be able to speak to the computer and have it read back because they can't um, necessarily read text the same. Now, so for many people, you will all have seen things like audible.com, where you can just download a, a book, a movie, essentially a book made as a movie, purchase, a few dollars, perfectly universally available. And that's amazing. You used to have books on tape going back in the day. You could buy from um, different, you know, uh, Angus and Robinson or, you know, the old bookstores. But they were abridged and not very long. Now you can download them, a click of a button, anyone can. It's, that's fantastic for culture. For work and study, and, you know, let's face it, um, a book on contract law doesn't quite have the readership of, say, Dan Brown. Um, you know, Fisher and Yuri getting to yes is an e-book, um, but you know that's got that's a different sort of kettle of fish. Very few books get that that interest. So, um, so you know, so you get your book, and what? How do you read it? Well, if you've got a book on Picasso's paintings or you go across to the med school and you get a book on cutting people open and looking at organs, there's not much you can do about making that just, you know, that a person with a voice read, screen reader can read because it's all images. And AI is actually working on that, um, artificial intelligence, but that's not really something I want to talk about today. That is, that's in the future and very hard. Um, sometimes you have graphs and tables. Now in economics, you can have pages and pages of tables with complicated numbers and there's not much you can do about that either. It's very hard to just turn that. You're gonna to have to get someone to help you. Sometimes a, public, a book is written and they have a few paragraphs made prettily around an image, um, all unnecessary to the substance. And I can't read that either, which they could, it's a bit of a pain because you can actually, 
Um, you should be able to translate that. Or if it's written in a table which is badly formatted, but if the table was correctly formatted, I could read it. A bit of a pain because in that scenario, there's absolutely no need for the barrier. It's just because of formatting. And then probably the most thing I get most frustrated with are uh, digital rights management where you cannot read the book using Adobe, Adobe Digital Editions. Now the ability to read the book in six weeks time beyond the license, it's convenient, but you know, that's a, it's fair enough. I can't read it, I don't, I don't want extra access, I just want equal access. So there's some of the barriers. Um, now going back, of course, you would have scanned, the libraries used to scan books and the Google Book Project started by scanning. And we've got a really cool scanner here, which will scan a book very quickly. The trouble with the scanning process, which is, as I said, fantastic, it's appreciated, is the books aren't edited by anyone, only they are edited by someone, usually the person's pressed for time. It's not edited by a publisher who will go through word by word, cross check, triple check, because if something's wrong in a text which is published, someone will find out and you'll make a blog and the publisher, the, whoever the editor is, will, won't be very popular with their publishing house. So, um, so this, what I used to get when I was at law school back a while ago now, um, I used to get my books digitally given to me, um, often in a format that wasn't necessarily usable, um, in the sense that you get a file, um, even if it's breaking down into chapters, um, the professor will say, could you turn to page 35, halfway down, you'll see this. Well, I can't see what page is. How do I cite? Ref how do I pinpoint reference? So um, I must admit, I've started, like, even in the next monograph I'm working with my mate from Harvard, we're going to use APA because you do less pinpoint referencing and it's easier. So, and it's, cause that's one of the barriers. And ebooks also, it's hard to pinpoint reference sometimes, but that's fine because no one else can. <laughs> um, which is good because, well, and they otherwise, but, um, so let's say even if you get the book and it's been spell checked, a good example was Gecko or Jico. Gecko or Jico? Jico, Gecko. Anyone heard of Jico, the insurance company? Run it through spell check, you get Gecko. <laughs> now, if you're, in a, if you're writing a law exam and say Gecko Insurance, the, uh, or the market will know it. If you're going to court to stand up and you appear, you're going to look rather stupid in front of the judge and your client and the world. And you're going to go, oh my god, and it's it's a serious problem. So and this is where ebooks reverse don't have that problem because they're born digital. It's all edited, and you can get it. So this book famine, this inability to access books, it has been a significant barrier to people with just print disabilities. Significant, indeed. My GPA jumped every time um, technology improved. Um, I'd like to say that it was because they became more motivated and more driven. Um, there might be something in that, but I don't think it was. Um, there were no significant out, outside the world, outside uni. So, but now it's like so much easier. I want a book. I email Tom, Thomas, Tom, wave. He's fantastic. And sometimes he says, "Have you looked at the catalogue?" And but here it is anyway because he's so nice. And I get, if it's not like Ron McCallum's book, get an e-book ordered. You know, it, it, well, days gone by. I had to scan it, and so much of a barrier. Now you get sent a book. It's so much easier. So, is this a right? Well, there is a right to access. This is now a human right. Now, the CRPD, the Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities, it's created a new disability politics. It's sweeping, it's paradigm shifting, and it's motivating, it's not just, well, it is motivating governments. If you look, um, our National Disability Insurance Scheme, why is it there? Well, look, have a look at, um, I was looking at reading worker screening um, amendments, you know, first line of that is why we're we doing it, CRPD mentioned. Disability reform amendments, CRPD mentioned. You know, everywhere, it's, this is what's driving us. It's, it's now shifting and the government's asking, indeed that's, it's got a commission, how compliant is this CRPD wise? You know, so they want to see it and they don't want to be seen as, they want to be, don't want to get slammed. So we're driving it. So what does it say in this space? Well, the CRPD restates all the existing rights, so the civil economic rights, right to work, hello, right to education, yeah, and but it all it rights information, but it also restates them in a way that is disability specific. So it creates a right to information communication technologies. So a right to ICT. 
Now that's pretty, it's not out, it's out there, it's different. Uh, it's having an impact. I mean, in poorer countries, this right to IC2 is motivating um, devices to be given to them in a cheaper format. Yeah, this right never existed before the, um, the um, CRPD. You could have said there was a right to access the internet. There was talk about that. It's maybe, maybe not. Article 9 of the CRPD contains a right to access. It requires states to ensure persons with disabilities um, have access to the physical environment, to transportation, to information and communication technologies, and ensure including um, the systems that are associated with the ICT. So that's the software and hardware. Um, obviously, we're, we're not there yet, but that's, that's a right now. So this grants rights to e-readers. So you'll see in America, the 21st Century Video and Accessibility Act, um, it's passed. They, don't have, they haven't ratified the CRPD, but they've got this, their law, so there's, it's obligated now. You have to make these devices accessible. Um, iPhones, universal design, it's becoming the norm. Now, so these devices now being, public, now being produced must be usable by people with print disabilities. Now, it's, so we've got these, these devices. This is great. We've got a device. Cool. So what do we do with it? Well, we, we want to be able to read books, right? Well, the Marrakesh Treaty is transformational, and that will be talked about later. And that's, a, that's for books everywhere. It's, it's amazing. Now, in education is an area where, not surprisingly, it's a very powerful right in the CRPD. So Article 24, um, it, gives a right to, it's, it creates a right to instructional materials. So it's a right. So we've always had a right to provide in, instructional materials under anti-discrimination laws. So we've always had that as an obligation. The CRPD has taken it so much further. It's not just a right to, that the student can say, please scan my book. Now this isn't enforceable in domestic law, but uh, the norm is that it should be accessible on the same basis. So that means um, Joe Bloggs walks down, picks up a book. Annie walks down, picks up a book. I walk down, where's the book? If I have to get it scanned, that's not equal access. If I have to wait a week, it's not equal access. If I wait an hour, is that equal access? How many hours is it before it's not equal? You know, is it five minutes not equal? And you know, might you think, well, what's five minutes? What's six minutes? Well, to your law graduate, six minutes is a billable unit. <laughs> um, so it does count, and and you oh, to me, six, and you, I mean, I'm very, I mean, um, I work, you know, if you wait six minutes, three times, four times a week, you would do it ten times as an hour, um, billable, and it's three, four hundred bucks. Um, so it, it's it actually has costs if you're in practice. So this has, so what does this right include? Well, in the CRPD talks about the right not to be segregated. So that just means you can't say you can't come and study here because you have a disability, um, unless it's a, a good, you know, there's got to be a very good reason. Um, even in, and when I say good reason, it's got to be very good. You might think people with mobility impairments can't work in a wet labs if they can't walk and wear the shoes, etc. Well, UQ's got a big process around that way where um, you know, we're really opening that up and training the, how accessible they can be, how we can modify it to make it accessible um, because of this normative shift. And so anyway, back to books. Um, so the right to participate has been denied to people across the globe, not for here for a long time, but the access to book materials, um, it's equal opportunity. So um, that really means in practice things like access to the Blackboard site, access to the PowerPoints, access to the reading materials. So when books, when chapters are scanned and put up, where are they put, how are they put? Are they usable? I mean, if it was a, if it's a 16th century, um, when I leave a wrote on a you know, handwritten diary ledger from some sea captain fighting the pirates, well, you know, that's not going to be real. That's not going to be um, easily read by a screen reader. But if it's something which is, it should be scanned readable, well, it's got to be in a format that can be read. Um, so you don't have equal access if not in, in particular in ebooks. We'll talk about um, Pam. will talk about what you can do there. But you don't. Let me just say you don't have equal access if 99% of the students can click on a button and open a book, and 1% can't. That means some library users aren't having equal access. So 
So what can, we'll talk, and Pam will talk also about what can libraries do around procurement, I think. You will? So just on procurement, and she'll, she'll talk about the practice of it, but it's there, it's not just a, um, you should do it, it's in the CRPD as an, one of the means to realise these rights. It's there in the general comments as you should be. So the general comments are issued by the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. It's there in the concluding observations on numerous times. Procurement is something which you are expected to do and if Australia is not doing it, we will get criticised against as a measure. And see even the dog shaking his head about that. <laughs> Can't believe that some people don't do disability inclusive procurement. So, so what is what has ebooks done? So, it impacts upon all your patrons. Ebooks. It makes it easier for everyone. Everyone can have a thousand books in their pocket, a million books, ten million books. That's what the iPhone when it gets into the cloud, everyone can access it. People with print disabilities, whether they be um, sighted or blind, fantastic readers or dyslexic able to hold the heavy book or quadriplegic, the, the ability, ability to access and consume these materials has been enhanced by ebooks. It's transformed my life. I really say my life, my career has been made possible by disability services and by librarians who've uh, facilitated access. Back at QT, they used to scan things that I don't really know if it was 100% legal, um, <laughs> to be honest, the way it would happen, but it was all done. You know, it was made possible. Um, you know, the, the librarians have taken the time. You know, Pam, when I got here, in, you know, back as a um, postdoc and scan, was scanning things. Tom, more recently, giving me e-books. Um, so it's library, librarians have worked around the laws, through the laws. Now you can work with the laws because the laws are supporting us getting access. So the point is reading equality is no longer a dream. It can be a reality. There's still work to do, of course. And it's work, like, work that people like me need people like you to do. We, all, we, are, we are all going on the same journey. We're all working towards the same thing. So I, wanna, I hope that we can work that it's no longer about me and you, but it's all about us, all about us trying to achieve equality, reading equality so everyone can read and everything can be accessible to everyone. So thank you and I'll hand over to the next speaker. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. That was very enlightening. Um, learned a lot of things. So we're going to um, have time at the end for some questions from all three of our speakers. So just hold your thoughts until the end. So our second speaker today is Pam Schindler, and she's a former liaison librarian with more than 30 years experience working at the University of Queensland Library. Um, Pam was a convener of the Library's Accessibility Working Party and a member of the UQ Disability Inclusion Group. More recently, Pam's presented Doing Our Part to End the Book Famine, UQ's eBook Accessibility Project at this year's Alia Information Online Conference. Please welcome Pam as our next speaker. Well, thank you. And I'm so pleased to be able to talk to you today about ebooks and accessibility. Australian university libraries have been rapid adopters of ebooks. At many university libraries, including University of Queensland Library, there is an e-preferred policy, and the library now has more titles in ebook form than in print. As Paul's been, been illustrating, for readers with a print disability, the coming of ebooks is especially significant. For these readers, the arrival of ebooks brings the great promise of unmediated direct access to the greater part of their library's book collection, rather than starting with a print book and format shifting. With ebooks, readers with a print disability should be able to click through to the book in a format they can use along with everyone else. It doesn't always happen. If the ebooks aren't accessible, this promise is unrealized. Almost every book starts life as a digital file, and digital text is flexible. But somewhere between the writing of the book and the experience of the reader, 
for various reasons or most commonly just failing to keep accessibility in mind in product design. Obstacles are built in to the design of many ebooks. Our students and staff work increasingly in a digital environment and so inclusion is increasingly realized in digital terms. Your university and mine, they all have policies committing themselves to providing equitable access for students with disabilities. And this applies to the physical campuses and also the electronic spaces. But how do libraries deliver on this commitment when we bring into that digital environment products with varying levels of accessibility, which are outside our control? This one minute video from JISC is still the best illustration I know of what's still wrong with some ebooks. Accessible ebooks, an alternative approach. I better play that again, I'm sorry. Something didn't work the way I expected it to. Accessibility is about equality of experience. Some platforms provide equality using accessibility options. Some platforms don't. If you don't, why not take the alternative approach? Make everything equally inaccessible to everyone. Make the font too small to comfortably read. Make text spill off the screen like a non-reflowing ebook. Or let it appear as an endless stream of unsorted words because the headings and lists aren't tagged. Or slot in random titles and call-out snippets because the reading order isn't tagged. Or make the text invisible like it can't be accessed by assistive technologies. Treat all readers equally. Make bad books for everyone! Or make ebooks accessible. Script and voiceover by Alistair McNaught, JISC, based on a discussion with Ben Watson, University of Kent. With grateful thanks to the wonderful publishers and aggregators who do take accessibility seriously. You know who you are. We love you. Accessible. Thank you, Alistair. Well, what makes an ebook more accessible? Beyond complying with WCAG guidelines, an ebook needs to be usable. So it needs to be designed so that a student with a print disability can do the things that any student needs it to do choose a chapter from the table of contents and proceed to read it. Navigate the document in a logical way, using only the keyboard, not the mouse, because a blind reader won't be able to use the mouse. Maybe enlarge the text, maybe change the font or the color. Maybe read the text aloud. Digital text can do all these things. Some aspects of an ebook's accessibility will depend on the practices of the publisher, and some will depend on the practices of the platform provider. By way, by way of illustration, <laughs> Um, I'd like to show you a page from an ebook read in various ways. We should expect to be able to use ebooks in flexible ways. Here's a page from an ebook written by a UQ academic, by Paul actually, and published by Cambridge University Press. We should be able to read it like this, but also like this if we like to reduce glare, or if you have colors that work especially well for you, choose your own colors. This is just using the options in Acrobat. If you need to change the font, no problem. This is a font designed to be more readable for people with dyslexia. If you need to enlarge the text, it should not look like this. This is enlarged 400%. Um, you can see half the text is off the screen and it would be necessary to scroll to the right, scroll to the left, very distracting and not necessary. It should be like this with reflow enabled so that when you enlarge the text, it rearranges itself to stay on the screen. And finally, like this, reading the text aloud with a computer-generated voice, in this case using a free online text-to-speech reader, this one's called Natural Reader. To access to information communication technologies, universal design, and the new disability human rights paradigm introduced by the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Introduction. Persons with print disabilities cannot read most of the digital and print books in the world and are said to be experiencing a book famine. 
This monograph argues that persons with print disabilities have a right to access the written word, and that emerging digital technologies provide the best means of redressing the book famine. In 2017, UQ Library conducted a project to explore the accessibility of a range of ebook platforms which students and staff commonly encounter through the library. A complete account of the project is in the conference paper, as mentioned, available freely in our digital um, repository, UQ eSpace. The project grew out of a goal the library set itself in our disability action plan to seek suppliers and publishers and prefer them if they provide their resources in more accessible formats. In the project, each ebook was tested twice, first by sighted librarians using a set of questions developed by JISC in the UK for their 2016 ebook accessibility audit, and secondly by two research technicians who were blind using screen reader software. We found a wide range in the accessibility of ebook platforms available through our library. The screen reader results were particularly illuminating. It found um, numerous obstacles for blind readers which we wouldn't have been able to detect. And in some cases, I really had to wonder if the ebook providers were testing their products with assistive technologies, could they really allow these obstacles to stand? Some of them were really quite simple. In one platform, for example, the download book button was undetectable. Surely that wouldn't be very hard to fix. Unlabeled links so that for the screen reader they read as um, clickable or link instead of saying download or print. Um, and in some platforms, a few of them, inability to navigate using only the keyboard from the platform into the frame where the book content was displayed. We videoed some of the screen reader testing so that we could share these examples of obstacles with the publishers. Here are two um, short video e excerpts from the screen reader testing. You'll hear the computer generated voice of the screen reader and the people present. So we're trying to get into the frame where the book is. Um, tab selected chapter. Tab oh. thumbnails. Tab selected chapter. Yes. He's reading the chapter and the Yeah, thumbnails. it says tab, tab selected chapter thumbnails. Clickable, right. clickable link previous chapter link next chapter. Right. Chapter is oh, yeah, next chapter. Out of link link previous. Mm -hmm. Right. Chapter so out of link. Tab down. Link What's next. What's the next thing e next chapter? There's a next chapter. Clickable. Mm -hmm. Out of list. Clickable, 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 clickable. Link previous chapter link next chapter. And then what happens? Clickable, clickable tab selected chapter. There's a tab selected, which is a chapter. Tab thumbnails. Uh -huh. and then, then there's a tab, which is the thumbnails. Right. Clickable, 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 viewing page 33 of pages 33, 52. Viewing pages 33 of 52. All right. Clickable, clickable, link, clickable, clickable, previous page. Previous page, link. next. Link, clickable, clickable, oh, link. Sorry. link, clickable, clickable, previous page. Previous clickable, page. clickable, graphic, clickable, page 33 of the environmental stewardship program. Oh. Clickable, link, clickable, 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 next page. Environmental stewardship link. Link, program. Clickable, next page. Yeah. Link, read link that. clickable, clickable, next page. And then it's got next page. Link, link, clickable, cl link. Link, clickable, clickable, next page. And this one where the text of the book was displayed in an iframe, and we couldn't get into the iframe. ACT, at original base, can HTTPISBN. EIS. Nine. Side of the banner at the top. Yeah. Page Canberra. ACT. Go back. There's a toolbar, a banner, and then content. We can't seem to get to the content I via keyboard. In a, from, in a, from, iframe. Oh, iframe. There you go. Yeah, the iframe is something to Great. The sound was a bit quiet on that one, but we were stuck in the banner at the top and couldn't get down into the text of the book itself. As the results of the study began to come together, the platforms began to fall into groups. Two important determinants of accessibility across various criteria were the formats the book is provided in, and in particular whether it's offered in HTML or EPUB, as well as PDF, and whether or not the book was subject to DRM software. Then there were some platforms where the screen reader difficulties were so serious that we thought those outweighed other factors. 
So we put the platforms into tables. Group one were the more accessible ones, providing HTML chapters to read online, PDF downloads, and no DRM. Group two were <coughs> PDF online, PDF download, no DRM. At that stage, we put ProQuest into a group by itself because it was doing something different from everyone else. And um, group four were the ones with particular concerns regarding using them with a screen reader. Back at UQ, the results of the project were used to create an accessibility checklist and a table of 29 platforms in broadly ranked groups. These were placed on the intranet for use by librarians in ordering. The checklist has been integrated with procurement procedures and the table will be updated annually. The checklist is available on UQ eSpace and anyone's most welcome to use it and improve on it. We now felt we could add a statement to the collection management policy to say that we prefer more accessible formats in ordering. I'd like to take it a step further. Of course I would. I'd like to ask at this stage, um, how shall we take accessibility into account in our demand-driven acquisition and in consortium purchasing? After the project, we sent the, re the results for, um, for their own platform to each of the publishers and aggregators and asked if they'd be interested in a follow-up conversation. And the response was wonderful, really, really positive. We had international phone calls and email exchanges, and we learned of a lot of new initiatives out there. And it really said to me that when libraries initiate discussions with providers about accessibility, and let them know its importance to our library service. That helps strengthen their arm to put more time and money into making their products accessible. What if we didn't have to test the products that we're offering through our library? What if we could find out from their web pages their accessibility features? In 2018, JISC's Aspire project tested the accessibility information on ebook providers' websites and ranked the results for publishers and for aggregators. The extensive consultation that went into the writing of the questions meant that they could say to ebook providers, with some authority, these are the things libraries say they need to know about your products. The Aspire questions, one list for publishers and one for aggregators, are still available on the project website and they're linked from the UQ checklist. And I would suggest they could be a useful tool in discussions with suppliers. The next stage for Aspire is a model whereby publishers and aggregators will be able to pay a modest fee to have their accessibility pages evaluated. And if they reach a high enough score, they'll be given a badge they can display. Recent developments, excuse me. Recent developments in the big aggregator platforms. I think it's worth noting some changes that have come to the big aggregators because we have so many books, ebooks on their sites. Since the big aggregators use DRM to control downloads, and DRM is one of the features which restricts accessibility, we should expect these platforms to provide a read online version which works well with assistive technologies. Here are some recent accessibility changes to the EBSCO and ProQuest platforms, and I'll go through these slides very quickly. In 2018, EBSCO moved to a new platform and now provides HTML chapters for read online. That's a really big step for one of the big aggregators. They're also providing EPUB versions of the great majority of their new titles. So if you go to an EBSCO ebook, the HTML chapters can be found at the bottom of the screen and the screen readers are taken there directly with a skip to content button. Here's a page of the book in PDF. Here's the same chapter in HTML with all the nice flexible options, copy and paste, zoom and reflow. The same chapter using a browser option to choose a dyslexia friendly font. ProQuest eBook Central is not providing HTML, but it's created what it calls an accessibility mode, which provides the books in page by page plain text. And this mode has explicit navigation, which, which works well with a screen reader. Since November last year, users can turn that mode on and off themselves using under settings. So here's a book on the ProQuest platform in online PDF, and you can see the prominent settings button. Here's the same page in accessibility mode, 
And the explicit navigation is very clear. This page is not bookmarked, create bookmark. Go to next page, go to previous page. The same page using a dyslexia-friendly font that you can select under settings. I can see a need for more work to provide clear pathways for our students in using library resources with assistive technologies. Recently, UQ Library has done some work in that direction by adding some ebook accessibility information to the web page and has created a digital literacy module called Accessibility and Study Hacks, which includes some assistive technology tools. Of course, there's more that needs to be done, but this is a good start. As a spin-off from our communications with JISC during the ebook project, we learned about accessibility snapshots. JISC offered snapshots free to all their 150 member institutions in 2018. The snapshot involves giving JISC a temporary student login. JISC then visits your university's major student-facing sites, taking the role of a computer literate student with a disability, and explores how well your site would work for that student. JISC then prepares a report with short and long-term recommendations, plus recognition of good practice where it's already in place. The whole process takes three days. Normally, it's only offered to JISC member institutions, but JISC agreed to do one for UQ on a paid consultancy basis. And because the staff have been working their way through all these universities across the UK, they have such a picture of practice and varieties of practice, and so they're really well informed to advise. UQ Snapshot gave us a 40-page plain English report with 92 recommended actions and has involved multiple parts of the university in addressing the recommendations. It cost us $5,000 Australian dollars, and we heartily recommend it and the recommended actions have now been incorporated into our new disability action plan. I've put the contact there for Alistair McNaught. Alistair is happy to do snapshots for Australian universities and would also be happy to offer a webinar, a, a webinar training session for library staff who would like to learn to do their own snapshots. If there's interest, perhaps that's something that could be coordinated through QLOC. New developments. There are some promising recent, de uh, recent developments in ebooks, and I wonder if we may be on the brink of a real breakthrough in making ebooks accessible. All around us, we see increasing availability of EPUB and HTML, increasing DRM free offerings, initiatives by individual publishers, and very impressive the Australian Inclusive Publishing Initiative, which is working towards born accessible publishing using EPUB. This is being piloted by the University of Sydney Press. Um, the AIPA has recently published online guides to accessible publishing in Australia, one for publishers and one for libraries, freely available in a choice of five formats from their web page. Well, how can libraries support equity in our ebook purchasing? We can inform ourselves about the features that contribute to ebook accessibility. We can use existing tools, such as the checklist, to integrate accessibility considerations into our purchasing. We can make sure our suppliers know how important accessibility is to our library service. Ask them for accessibility information. Ask if they test their products with assistive technologies. Use the Aspire questions. Continue to raise awareness amongst library staff, but also amongst disability support staff and students um, of the flexible options that are out there and the capabilities of formats such as EPUB. Provide clear pathways for students using eBooks with assistive technologies. Use our purchasing power to, to support the more accessible models and collaborate and share good practice with other libraries. Libraries and book publishers are living through a time of rapid technological change, which has the capacity to be hugely enabling. Librarians have a role to play in ensuring that it delivers for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. You guys are making my job very easy. I haven't had to give anyone a time. <laughs> which is good because I was so busy listening. Um, our final speaker is 
Tom Joyce. Um, and Tom is the University of Queensland copyright and library lawyer. Tom also holds a Master of Law from the London School of Economics, where he specialised in intellectual property and is admitted as a barrister of the Supreme Court of Queensland. And Tom's going to take us uh, through an update on the changes of copyright and the implications of the Marrakesh Treaty for librarians. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. To the right. Uh -huh. If you just use the, the the arrows, you should be able to move on from there. All right. Okay. The Benkes Treaty really was very significant. As someone who's uh, studied and followed copyright law over a long time. It was significant for persons with print disabilities. It was also significant for librarians and for anyone with an interest in the relevance of copyright law um, and its adaptability to um, modern times. Because for a lengthy period, certainly the length of period of my scholarship uh, in the area, which goes back uh, over 30 years, there has been uh, a retreat from the multilateral um, um, uh, core of agreement uh, that was um, created by the original Berne Convention. Uh, we've seen a fracturing of the multilateral system uh, from the WIPO-driven, uh, that is the World Intellectual and Property Organization-driven uh, norm building and treaty building uh, consensus we've seen a breakdown of that into a more transactional and regional. Um, and it was Francis Gurry uh, interviewed in 2012. Francis Gurry, coincidentally only, um, is uh, an Australian who's the head of the WIPO. He was the head of WIPO then, the World Intellectual Property Organisation, and he still is uh, a head of WIPO. And I will avoid any suggestion uh, of Australia punching above its weight in having Australia as the head of WIPO, but you know, on a day when jingo, no, no, not enough jingoism can ever be enough. Um, the, but he was interviewed, and one of the things that the points he made uh, was that WIPO's relevance uh, as an organisation which continued to benefit uh, not just the creators uh, and the publishers and the, the, those who would monetize copyright, but those who would use copyright. And that balance, which was originally struck in the Berne Convention between the rights of creators and owners and the rights of users, an essential balance. And that balance over a lengthy period uh, had been skewing away from users. And we still have outstanding issues, and that's partly what I want to discuss in terms of the relevance of Marrakesh and what does it mean in terms of us in terms of librarians, in terms of users of copyright. Because certainly Marrakesh was a, a critical moment for WIPO. But the, it's, it's ironical in a sense that Marrakesh was also, some 12 years earlier, uh, was the uh, home of the, uh, the birthplace of the World Trade Organization. And we'll come to the WTO in a moment because copyright and the rights of users of copyright materials um, had gotten mashed up a little in the late 1990s with the uh, General Agreement on Trade and Tariff becoming the World Trade Organization and the World Trade Organization co-opting or cutting and pasting some of the fundamental rights and obligations from the copyright treaties uh, into trade law. Um, and that had a significant impact. And for persons who are scholars in the area or practitioners in the area, copyright law, once it became enmeshed in trade law, uh, the ability of WIPO to transact or to create norm, new norms, to create the consensus around uh, treaty making in areas such as uh, access for print disability seemed to be under real threat. Um, so really, that relevance, um, that relevance, we live in a world actually more generally where the, the things which have created the 
uh, energy around multilateral systems, that ability to agree among large numbers of nations has seemed also to be on decline. We see the witness of it now. There was an article, uh, an op-ed in the New York Times last week by someone who said, look, democracy probably is an aberration. You know, democracy, we naturally bend towards tyranny. We naturally bend towards our transactional individual needs. And certainly in intellectual property and uh, copyright more generally, the last 20 or more years has seen a bending away from large-scale multilateralism on matters like this, on matters where we were talking about the non-transactional, non-economic rights of people, of users of copyright materials, leaving aside other forms of intellectual property. Um, and that, at a time when technology was changing and enabling for example, persons with a print disability, or enabling the capacity of persons more generally to have access to, say, for example, orphaned works. Um, that at that, that very time, the ability seemingly to create agreement um, between nations was being undermined. The World Trade Organization, I won't bore you with it, but it's an important part of that underlying um, uh, energy over the last say, couple of decades. When, it, when the World Trade Organization took the uh, fundamental rights and obligations of the WIPO copyright and other IP treaties and put them into a trade treaty, the TRIPS agreement, it made it subject to uh, complaint, subject to World Trade Organization tribunal adjudication and potentially sanctions. So the capacity to, for countries to come together and agree on copyright changes which potentially uh, might undermine or threaten uh, the interests of copyright owners was put at risk. The idea of being uh, an outlier, the idea of legislating individually, because the right to legislate individually in rare areas of print disability, for example, or to, write, to, to legislate in areas like um, uh, orphaned works, or the protection of uh, indigenous folklore. These are all rights which exist today, regardless of any international treaties that we might still need. They exist under the rights given in the original Berne Convention. But it is a very rare and brave country that would legislate in areas which undermine potential economic interests of copyright owners without international action, without the norm setting that comes from multilateral action. And that's why Marrakesh was in some ways something of a shock. Um, Marrakesh, not the, not the creation of WTO, but Marrakesh um, in 2013, when WIPO managed to get agreement amongst its membership, um, which at the time was over 160 countries, uh, it managed to get sufficient signatories to the treaty um, to move forward to uh, ratification. Uh, that was not only significant for WIPO, it was significant for any persons who deal with copyright users, who deal with, for example, whether in the library sector, persons with print disability, persons who may have some hope that eventually the vast repository of orphaned works which exist but which at the moment are locked away. Uh, Paul was making the point before that he has an elderly, was it your mother, Paul? My grandmother. Your grandmother? Yeah. Um, and she's almost 95. 95. We were speculating that if she'd written a book when she was uh, five and she lived for another, say, five years, might crack the ton, um, then that work, which may not have been made commercially available or accessible since, say, she was seven, say, um, would be uh, protected by copyright law for, another, uh, for a total of 170 years, um, but not made available. Copyright is the ultimate slurotic form of intellectual property in that form. With trademarks, you use them or lose them. Patents, you've got a limited number of time and they're gone. Copyright, you can write a penny dreadful, not your grandmother, <laughs> not your Paul, but you can write the penny dreadful um, or a significant work, a significant work and it will remain protected by copyright even though it's no longer accessible and available uh, at all. And so therefore Marrakesh was important, had an outsized importance 
um, in terms of the capacity of WIPO and of not just WIPO as an entity, but the international community to still be able to come to agreement on matters which are, are relevant to copyright users uh, that are not uh, simply transactional and economic um, because the, the breakdown of that system um, creates an enormous amount of delay. Um, the, the delay every, every year, if Marrakesh or the types of change that Marrakesh brought about could have occurred 20 years earlier, you would have a generation of persons. With the, the persons with print disability in places like India, for example, where uh, is extremely high, um, and accessibility to works, uh, not through, say, ebook publisher formats or, for example, but just by being able to get someone in a library to find an accessible format of a work under their new rights, fair dealing rights. Um, that capacity, the, every day it's delayed, is a day lost. Um, and patience in that circumstance is a very difficult thing. So therefore, I think that for WIPO and for persons like ourselves, uh, who are interested and concerned about seeing that balance in copyright maintained, uh, that international conversation and international norm setting. Norm setting and also hopefully treaty making on occasion. Sometimes it's not going to be treaty making. Treaty making, honestly, we need the patience of persons studying maybe geological time. I mean, it is incredibly slow. Um, would we have a similar treaty um, at an international level on orphaned works? Uh, in the next 20 years. I don't think we would. Could we have legislation tomorrow in any individual country? Yes, we could. Are we likely to? No, because that sort of one-off action is, in this day and age, likely to bring about, for example, the WTO complaint. We need to continue that uh, international discussion, international norm setting, and WTO and the WIPO remains a really significant part of that. So it's not only a question of maintaining their relevance and keeping pace with change. It's also incredibly important that we buy into that and Australia and other countries buy into that with other issues around. For example, I can't remember, I've been, as I say, over three decades, the protection of traditional folklore um, and traditional knowledge, which goes beyond copyright into areas like patents and the frame, that has been a discussion that goes back to when I was an undergraduate. Um, it'll see me off. At least see me off in a professional sense. I don't know. I don't want to see me off. Um, and certainly the discussion around orphan works is another one. Um, but we have to celebrate. Um, and the celebration, if you'd said to me uh, 10 years ago that we would have the 2013 agreement, I probably would have been um, a little pessimistic. Um, I, you know, when we had the discussion in Australia about introducing a fair use and there was great optimism. I was deeply cynical and sadly that cynicism was borne out. Alas, you don't want your cynicism borne out. You want to be proved quite wrong. And Marrakesh uh, was wonderful. Uh, and Marrakesh is greatly enabling. Uh, we also have to remember a bit though that we are the lucky ones. We are, operate in the university and the university library sector in an environment where we can gain access through uh, sophisticated ebook publishing formats uh, which we purchase access to. The more generally, uh, libraries now are able to have an individual in a country where there is domestic legislation like Australia come in and seek a format, a suitable format that is appropriate to their print disability. And over time, and under the legislation and under the treaty, they are, we are able to uh, obtain access to suitable formats in any other country where that suitable format might exist. And I know the Canadian Blind Union and others are working towards having international databases on these types of suitable formats. So that fact that, that there's an individual right now to walk in the door and say, look, this is my need, outside of um, what a publisher may provide under an e-book um, agreement. Um, so, on that note, uh, and with that optimism, um, I, I, I would uh, commend uh, Marrakesh uh, and everything that flies with it uh, to you as librarians. <laughs> All right then, thank you.
Thank you, Tom. Okay, that um, was incredibly interesting and diverse and nicely placed together um, set of speakers. Um, from having Paul tell us about what it actually means from an end user perspective, which is something that as librarians we're always extremely keen to hear. Um, and it's opened my eyes to a couple of interesting things which I knew but forgot. One of which is that um, digitising stuff is not the answer always to everything. Um, and then for Pam to tell us um, some very practical, and again, I learnt a couple of things and I've written down some things to make check. Um, and again, something that makes me proud to be a librarian is that we lead the way in caring about our, our users and not just caring, but actually finding solutions. And then uh, Tom putting it all um, into place. So we've got the end user, we've got some practice, and then we've got the policy and the big picture. So I think you'll all agree that was um, a really um, all round uh, good approach to this really important issue. We do have a little bit of time for some questions, um, and I am taking questions from uh, the people on Zoom. I hope you're still there. I forgot to re welcome you when I started, but I assumed that you knew I cared about you. <laughs> <laughs> so are there any questions for any of our panellists? Can you speak up? Yeah, my name's Anthony, but I'm the information policy officer for the And it's a question about um, the accessibility. We know in the past when you have a book you might get from the publisher, you, they might send you a PDF or something like that for some services. Um, with the evil people, do they do a similar thing and it's not accessible? Or what, what proportion of uh, uh, the moment of the library things want to be accessed or accessed through the new technology or, or accessed or, or can be accessed through the old thing or accessing the uh, digital PDF? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I think so. so is, is, is that, is that, is that, uh, is that shift? You might need to read from, is it? Yeah. Could you repeat the question yeah. again? I'll try to. Summarise the question. Um, and tell me if I, if I haven't got it right. I think the question was um, saying that in the past, we've quite often, we or disability services, whoever is responsible for it, has often contacted the publishers to ask for an accessible copy or perhaps a, a non-DRM controlled um, version of a book on behalf of a staff member or a student. Um, that, um, that still goes on and one of the things that is on the accessibility help pages of the publishers who have given us enough information is to say if our copy doesn't work for you, here is who you contact, here is our turnaround time. I've seen one that says if our ebook doesn't work for you, contact us, we will send you a DRM free copy in three to five days. I think that's admirable. Um, and, but you can see it varies a lot from publisher to publisher and site to site. Um, some publishers participate in Bookshare, and so they direct you to Bookshare to access your book that way, but um, it, it's a question of how much of the content you need is in Bookshare and so on. Um, so that, um, that ability to request still goes on. I, would, I don't have figures on it. I think because so much of our collection is in ebook form, um, we're getting fewer quest questions from people wanting something scanned or, or obtained for them because mostly we can, I suppose, mostly we're getting the electronic copies to work, but, um, but that's still an option and still people have the right to ask for that. Is that what you were asking? Yeah, I just yeah. wondered, do you think with the, the interest with the, the movement towards having more vehicles, the, um, that the, the situation is at least improving. It's not, as you present, it's not ideal. More things mm -hmm. to be done. We're moving towards an improvement. I think it has to be an improvement. Yeah. yeah. But as you could see, there are still um, <laughs> there are still sites that are not working properly, and 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 it's in everyone's interests to have an ebook format that is going to work for the largest number of people. It's more work for the publishers if they're going to have to respond to individual requests for accessible copies. Mm -hmm. um, and what we're after is universal design and something that's going to work for people across the board without having to, um, to treat the person with a disability as an exception. You know? yeah. 
Uh, I've got another question from somebody on chat. So uh, for me or for Pan? Yeah. So they've already tracked down your accessibility checklist, mm -hmm. but they had a question about um, will it be updated or is there an updated version of the uh, a version available? Um, it it was updated not too long ago, um, and. It, it will be updated. Um, I imagine that there, the library staff will be updating certainly the table of, of platforms which we've run through the checklist and we've planned to do that annually and I, I'm sure we would update the, the checklist at the same time or if there were out-of-date things on it more often. It won't be my responsibility now because I'm retiring from UQ but um, certainly the intention is to keep it updated as it's going to be an ongoing tool in, in our selection work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you make uh, an accessible format where where the publisher doesn't provide a fully sufficiently uh, accessible format, do you gain the right to retain that? I mean, do your ebook agreements have they evolve so that it can be used for other than just that person? Because we're dealing with contracts here, mm -hmm. we're dealing you know, with an ebook like supplier agreement, etc. Because mm -hmm. uh, the ebook supplier agreements would be continuing to evolve, I suspect. Yes, and I haven't. Yeah, sorry. Just, uh, oh, reminder from our audience. follow up on that. Audience, one. Could you repeat the question? Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. Um, thank you for that. Uh, I, Tom's question was when we receive a, a copy, an accessible copy of a book on behalf of a student from a publisher, do we have the right to retain it? Was that? You just, are the ebook contracts evolving so that, that the one off? Where you have an ebook, or where you make further modifications, where you receive the mm -hmm. DRM free mm -hmm. uh, copy, and then you make an accessible, uh, mm -hmm. so a, a, a specifically accessible copy for the person. Uh, do we retain that uh, file, uh, and make them, or do we, or are the contracts still? Um, so, so mm. restricted. You might know the answer oh, to that. I think yeah. the contracts are still quite restricted yeah. Yeah. Um, because it's a, a, a one to one still yeah. um, and they haven't necessarily evolved. And I think that comes back to one of the things Pam said about perhaps um, working as a consortia or um, as a, a bigger group of people rather than the one on one libraries coming in to try and change some of the things so that we can actually you know, uh, make it easier and also make it easier for the publisher because then mm. you have to keep going back each it, time. But it would be ideal to have those formats yes. which don't economically affect the publisher or... Um, no, they they don't, but they still yeah, are quite so, controlled. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. so, um, yeah, I think that's something we could certainly look at, you mm. know, as a, as a profession, I think we probably should... As a profession. Yeah. Any other questions? I think we're a little bit over time, but that was very interesting. Um, and um, I'm a really bad timekeeper, and uh, Adam will never ask me to timekeep again. Um, but I did want to just um, ask everybody to thank our three um, speakers again, Paul, Tom, and Pam, for a very um, enlightening talk. Um, so please join me in thanking them once more. And I'd like to um, ask you all to come and have some refreshments outside. For those of you on Zoom, please um, grab yourself a cup of tea, have a bit of a reflection either by yourself or find a friend to discuss some of the things that you've heard this morning. And thank you for joining us on Zoom. Um, it's been a pleasure having everybody here. Thank you.